What's up guys and welcome to the next video in our mini series on general strikes. The mini being in quotations of course. Today we're finally covering the 1934 Minneapolis Teamsters strike. Or strikes, you'll see what I mean. Sorry this video took longer than expected, there were a lot of sources I needed to read before making this one. Anyway, it's time to talk about the May strike. The strike began on May 16th, 1934, with workers from just 46 of the 166 trucking firms walking off their jobs. Workers from the remaining 120 firms were supposed to report to work if their employers needed them, but they were not needed because trucking in Minneapolis effectively ceased. Strikers picketed for up to 15 hours at strategic points, from the market district to the city limits to ensure that only union-authorized trucks were on the roads. The union permitted only union coal, milk, and beer trucks to operate in the city, while any trucks that tried to move under police escort were often turned back or confiscated. Gas stations reluctantly participated in the strike. In one case, strikers ripped a fuel pump out of the ground to ensure this, though simply parking trucks around the pumps and locking them was the preferred method. It's estimated that as much as 95% of workers supported the strike, or 65% of the entire city. Many of the fellow AFL unions offered up their services to support the strike. They understood that the labor movement in Minneapolis was on the line. Local 574 claimed that 5,000 workers were on strike, and assuming that figure is true, you would expect strike support to struggle to care for the community. And you'd be wrong. The arduous women's auxiliary operated the commissary in 12-hour shifts, serving food 24 hours a day. They served everything from vegetable soup and baked goods to chicken dinners or spam, supplied by the Minnesota Farm Holiday Association, grocers, farmers, and local unions. Every night, meetings were broadcasted to thousands around headquarters to keep up morale, while the organizer, Local 574's internal organ, became a daily newspaper informing workers about why the Teamsters were on strike while combating the anti-labor newspapers. So naturally, the employers were pretty pissed. After a couple of days, the Trucking Employers Committee and the Citizens Alliance decided to create a Law and Order League to work with the police and escort scab trucks throughout Minneapolis. This decision was influenced by farmers, who realized that their produce would spoil long before the strike was settled. To increase their numbers, the police recruited and deputized 500 of Minneapolis's worst, many of whom were college frat boys, salesmen, clerics, lawyers, and even some prisoners. On Saturday, May 19th, Police and special deputies armed with clubs and lead pipes escorted trucks to the market district to be loaded with goods. When the strikers attempted to stop the trucks, they were outnumbered and beaten bloody across the head, arms, and ankles. The injured were transported back to headquarters to have their wounds treated, with about a dozen of them seriously wounded, but the worst came later that evening. A spy working for the police and the Citizens Alliance convinced two or three trucks of male and female strikers to head to the docks in Newspaper Alley. It was from this cul-de-sac that the anti-labor Minneapolis Journal and Minneapolis Tribune were loaded and distributed throughout the city. When the strikers arrived, the police and special deputies sprang the trap. They beat the strikers with nightsticks, some so severely they had to be taken to the hospital. It was this event that changed the pace of the strike, something the organizers knew would eventually happen. That Sunday at headquarters, strikers started arming themselves with wind boards, pipes, or clubs they got from a hijacked scab truck. 574's leadership decided to focus large numbers of picketers in the market district, thereby avoiding any more potential ambushes and centering the picket where the trucks would be going anyway. Knowing that the police were armed with pistols and shotguns, the leaders came up with a strategy to get as close as possible to the police. While this initially seems counterintuitive because it would make the strikers an easier target and because who would want to be that close to a bunch of filthy pigs, the strikers believed that they would not use guns in a situation where they risk hitting fellow deputies. Oh, how the times have changed. Anyway, on the following day, May 20th, the Employers Committee published a full-page ad arguing that the truckers were being paid 50 cents per hour and agreed to bargain collectively as long as they did not have to sign a written contract. However, a survey showed that while some were making 50 cents, many truckers were making at max 42.5 cents an hour and helpers only 40 cents. On Monday morning, May 21st, the police and special deputies blocked off the market district and prepared a path for the scab trucks. The trucks pulled up to the loading docks, where they were loaded with a few crates. At that moment, hundreds of strikers poured into the market district, many of them confronting and scaring off the driver of the first loaded truck. The strikers then turned their attention to the police and the special deputies, focusing mainly on the latter. The special police were not prepared for the beating they received and hightailed it out of there, barely giving the strikers a fight. 
Cheered on by many spectators, the strikers then took the fight to the not so yellow bellied cops. The police were completely surrounded and squealed for backup, getting some 1,500 officers to join the battle, though many bystanders joined in to even the odds. After one cop suffered a somewhat serious injury, the cops pulled out their guns. And that's when the strikers were like, you've activated my trap card. Bob Bell drove like a bat out of hell to the center of the fight, delivering 25 strikers. The police got an ass whooping same day delivered to them, 60 years before Amazon even existed. And with that, the strikers successfully forced the police to retreat. While all that was happening in the market district, Clara Dunn and Marva Shaw led a protest of hundreds of women down to the city hall, demanding that the police chief, Mike Johannes, be terminated, the special deputies disbanded, and that pickets be allowed to continue, but the mayor refused to meet with them. That day, the trucks did not move, and 37 people were seriously injured, mostly on the police side. Agitated by the day's events, the electricians and the painters union went out on strike in sympathy of the Teamsters offering their assistance to 1900 Chicago Avenue, while other unions proclaimed that their workers were on holiday for the duration of the strike. The next day, both sides met again for round two as thousands stood in the market area, many of them spectators. Everyone was timid at first until someone threw a crate of tomatoes through a window, or a pro-union woman took out an anti-labor deputy woman, depending on who you ask. Fight! That's when the strikers and the police and special deputies went at it though the anti-labor side hardly stood a chance even after they received reinforcements. The special deputies again got the worst end of the confrontation since as soon as the battle broke out, they were pelted with stones or clubs. They fought or fled as best they could, but many stumbled or were roughed up. They were so ineffective that even the police looked at them like, really guys? Both sides suffered some casualties, but once again the anti-labor side received most of the serious ones. Two were fatally wounded, including a prominent businessman in the Citizens Alliance, Arthur Lyman. <laughs> I guess they call him Arthur Lyman because his ass got laid out. Anyway, on this day, the strikers drove every cop out of the market district and away from HQ, taking over operations there, including directing traffic and allegedly preventing property damage with the security group they created. Following these two very eventful days, Governor Olson urged that there be a 24-hour truce. He also deployed 3,700 National Guard soldiers, but did not declare martial law or break the strike, knowing that most of his supporters were labor. Both sides accepted. It was time to negotiate, though the employers again refused to sit in the same room as the general driver's negotiators or agree to sign a written contract. During the walkout, many strikers had been terminated from their jobs, so one of the union's demands was that these workers be reinstated. The employers initially rejected this, but agreed after Local 574 conceded the demand of the closed shop for de facto recognition of the union. The truce was later extended, and during this period, members of Electrical Workers Local 292 and the Bridge Structural and Ornamental Iron Workers Local 19, among others, voted to go on strike on May 24th. More importantly, James B. Cannon of the Communist League of America opposition flew to Minneapolis, really showing how important this event was considering how expensive a plane ticket was compared to the org's limited funds. He and the rest of the CLAO had been watching the events of Minneapolis unfold from New York. Vince Dunn and Skoglin had not contacted them, believing that they were too busy with the New York strike and some ongoing factionalism, something they regretted as the League could have helped them with negotiations. Cannon was the guy they needed as he detested state-sponsored labor boards and professional arbitrators. He also understood that while Governor Olson supported the union and the Minnesota labor movement, he would only support them so far and call out the National Guard to preserve peace and order. This is effectively strike-breaking, as we'll soon see. Anyway, by the time Karen arrived, there was little left to negotiate, and on Saturday, May 26th, the strike officially ended. The 11-day strike initially appeared to be a sound victory for the Union, as it won recognition more or less, the reinstatement of all strikers, and arbitration over hours and wages. But a closer look at the language of the agreement rejects this conclusion. The agreement defined employees as workers related to ordinary trucking operations, but failed to further elaborate on this definition or clarify how inside workers fit into it. And with employees still ambiguous, who exactly could the Union represent? The settlement further stated that disagreements between the union and the employers were to be resolved via the Board of Arbitration, but the imprecise language of the document failed to define how these boards would be structured. To further complicate this, it's worth noting that the union would have to negotiate with each individual employer. And to top it all off, the makeup of the employers' committee made things more difficult, as while it did represent the 166 trucking employers, this did not guarantee that each one would comply. 
The leaders were well aware the agreement was not the end of the road, but believed that it effectively called for the employers to recognize the union, negotiate for contracts, and meet with arbitration boards. Cannon and the organizers were upfront with the strikers, explaining that the agreement was a compromise with the bosses and the problems with it. But more militant strikers were not satisfied with the agreement and even wanted to declare a general strike, but the organizers urged them to ratify it. Not doing so would guarantee defeat since the National Guard would likely get involved and the Union was not equipped to fight it. Ultimately, Local 574 voted to ratify the agreement and on May 29th, all strikers went back to work. While a formal general strike had not been declared, the majority of working folks in Minneapolis were either on strike or directly supporting it. It was an impressive achievement. Local 574 carried out a successful large-scale strike in an open shop city against over 150 employers and the police, and in that regard, it was a clear victory. Except, of course, to the Communist Party. The CPUSA opposed the organizers, calling them agents of the bosses, and declared that the May strike had been a complete failure, all because the organizers failed to develop a true workers' party to combat the Farmer Labor Party. Some of the harshest criticism came from William F. Dunn. That's right, brother of the Dunns and member of the Communist Party. This leftist infighting stuff is much older than you think. I'm not really going to spend any more time on the Communist Party in this video, but just know that their criticism of the strike leaders was uh, unpopular to say the least. And at one point in the July strike, Cannon was using the organizer to convince folks not to rough them up. Following the strike, Police Chief Johannes demanded that his budget be doubled to afford 400 officers, a police academy that would train officers like an army, 26 motorcycles, machine guns, 800 rifles with bayonets, 800 clubs, and 800 steel helmets. The Law and Order Committee and employers attempted to retaliate by having strikers arrested for various crimes, including the murder of Arthur Lyman. This included Happy Holstein, an indigenous driver and strike leader who was one of two arrested for this alleged crime. His bail? $10,000. In 1934! The union got him out by putting up the Milk Drivers Union Hall. Holstein was later acquitted. The Citizens Alliance, even more upset, devoted $50,000 to defeat the next strike a drop in the bucket compared to the $1.9 that the strike cost Minneapolis. In addition to that, they spent the better part of two months publishing all sorts of anti-union propaganda in the press, including claiming that their workers were satisfied, that Local 574 represented only a few hundred workers, and that the organizers wanted to turn Minneapolis into the next Soviet republic. Man, the press sure does know how to make us communists look cooler than we actually are. Almost immediately, the union struggled to get trucking employers to abide by the terms of the weak agreement. It contained no specific wage scale, and employers who had agreed to raise wages until spring of the following year lowered their wages back to pre-strike levels. They also ignored Local 574 and Governor Olson's attempts to create an arbitration board. Basically, employers rejected that the union represented their employees, so no negotiation could take place. With no negotiation underway, there couldn't be a failure to negotiate, and therefore the Regional Labor Board couldn't step in to arbitrate. When Local 574 appealed to the board for help, the vague language of the agreement combined with the reluctant mediators offered little hope. When the Regional Labor Board asked Governor Olson to clarify his vague position on inside workers, he backtracked. He proposed a restriction on Local 574 saying that it could only represent drivers and helpers, receiving and shipping clerks, stevedores, and freight elevator operators. That was only about half of its membership. The Labor Board agreed. Not that it mattered much, since the 11-member board had no power to enforce its rulings and was utterly useless. In the first week of July, it was tied 5 for the union and 5 for the employers, but the chair refused to break the tie. And just as it appeared it couldn't get worse, Teamsters President Dan Tobin demanded Local 574 pay its initiation fee of a dollar a person. The union could not afford this, as its membership was nearing 7000 plus it had paid for the February and May strikes on its own. The obstacles the General Drivers Union were up against could not be overcome with diplomacy, so the organizers planned a second strike. To prepare for this strike, Local 574 without a doubt analyzed the structure of the previous strike and further developed it. A new strike headquarters was opened at 225 South 3rd Street where every Friday evening classes on trade union history and strike strategy were held. They re-established a strike garage with beds, an infirmary, and a commissary at 215 South 8th Street and even recruited Dr. McCrimmon and the original nurse from the May strike. The organizers again met with unemployment councils and organized an unemployed section of the union, 5,000 strong. The Women's Auxiliary, which had performed admirably during the previous strike, met regularly and recruited new women into its ranks. 
They made hospital visits to those who had been injured in the previous strike, sold more issues of the organizer, and collected money for those who had lost their jobs. On the topic of raising money, Local 574 raised 700 dollar dues, as one of my homies would put it, with a dance catered by Union Beer, the best kind of beer, while the CLA asked members to donate a full day's pay to the union. The organizer continued to carry inspirational messages while countering the lies of the bosses published in the pro-capitalist press. With the organizer, Cannon and others found unique ways to inspire solidarity, including a series of letters between Mike and Emily, whose purpose was to speak to the working class of Minneapolis. It, along with leftist organizers, helped Minneapolis's working class gain a better understanding that the state suppresses labor, even if most of those folks were still anti-communist themselves. It also informed workers about the events going on, what events were planned, and what still needed to be done. There were a couple of major differences from the previous strike, one being a legal team of CLA members and the other a pact with the Farmers Holiday Association, Farm Bureau, and the Market Gardeners. Farm trucks would be allowed to move freely so long as they showed which org they were with, while the union set aside a place in the market district to allow them to sell their goods. This initiative resulted in increased food donations to the union. On July 6th, in an incredible display of solidarity, the union held a working class parade featuring local 574, the women's auxiliary, motorcycle couriers, street railway workers, building tradesmen, brewery workers, printers, municipal employees, railroad workers, students, and the unemployed. Afterwards, there was a rally attended by thousands featuring speakers such as Roy Weir, president of the Central Labor Union, John Bosch of the Farm Holiday Association, Robert Fleming of the St. Paul Teamsters Local 120, Reuben Lotz of the Laundry Workers Union, and Myrtle Harris of the Garment Workers Union. The organizers responded to accusations that they were Reds and wanted to overthrow the government in front of thousands of people, criticizing the current system and stating that it was about time it was changed. With the demands of the right to organize inside workers, the wage increase of the previous agreement, and that employers signed a plainly worded agreement with the union, the organizers gave the trucking firms until July 11th to accept or face another strike. Meanwhile, the regional labor board met with representatives from both sides to hopefully resolve differences, to no success. At one point, 22 warehouse firms came forward stating that they would recognize inside workers and arbitrate wages for warehouse workers, but that this would not extend to the other 144 firms. The union rejected this offer as it was too risky. And it's here I want to introduce Eugene Dunnigan of the National Labor Board, who had been sent to Minneapolis by Washington to mediate negotiations between the two parties and avoid a strike. He introduced himself to Local 574 as a friend of labor, but the union didn't fall for it knowing that guys like him would get the union to settle for less. The employers and Tobin were doing their best to avoid a strike too. Using Tobin's words, the employers criticized the union by stating that the International Brotherhood of Teamsters did not approve of the organizers or the threat of a general strike. Tobin himself even pressured the St. Paul general drivers to vote against participating in the strike. But all this did not discourage the organizers, who gave a harsh rebuttal to their opposers, especially Tobin on July 11th. That same day, the General Drivers Union voted unanimously to strike and immediately organized a 100-member committee and executive board to create strategies. Dobbs and B.R. Dunn became the union's negotiators. In a last-ditch effort, Dunnigan begged that the union wait five days. The union agreed. They still needed to have the secret ballot vote, a bylaw of the Teamsters. You know, bureaucracy and all that. Now, I know what you might be thinking. Surely not everyone in the union agreed with the strike or the leaders. And you're correct. So just prior to the strike, union leaders met with union members who opposed the strike. Bill Brown explained to them that he also didn't want to strike, but the employers had left the union no choice and confirmed that Local 574 was trying to build one big union so powerful that it could control the trucking industry. The leaders turned a opposition meeting into a strike demonstration. Two resolutions were then proposed, asking the opposers if they wanted a change in leadership and a secret ballot. I suppose you could say they didn't because on July 16th, over 2,500 union members voted unanimously to go on strike. At midnight, they walked out. Once again, the early days of the strike were calm. Pickets, including those of the flying variety, were once again established to keep trucks from moving, but strikers were instructed not to provoke the police or carry melee weapons. The union had a system to monitor requests for truck movements during the strike while hospitals, orphanages, and any other public works were supplied with whatever they needed. 
Taxis and unionized beer, ice, milk, and bakery trucks were given exemptions. In response, Governor Olson deployed 4,000 soldiers of the National Guard at 4th Avenue in the 6th Street Armory, while the National Labor Board sent Father Francis J. Haas to support Dunnigan in creating a settlement. On Thursday, July 19th, 11 police cars and 44 officers armed with shotguns moved a truck hauling only five boxes on it, draped in a banner reading hospital supplies. Reporters followed the convoy, eager to capture something. Hospital supply trucks already had an exemption from the strike, so there was no need for the police to escort it. It was clear to the union that the police wanted to start a riot by getting strikers to try and stop the truck, which would then be caught by reporters. While the pro-capital press reported that the picket had been broken, the organizer correctly reported that the bait had not been taken. The next day, Friday, July 20th, will forever be remembered as Bloody Friday. Employers planned on moving a truck affiliated with a grocery store on 3rd Street North, and police blocked off the area. The union responded by sending in a total of 5,000 picketers. Soon, an unmarked truck pulled into the market district, escorted by police armed with riot guns, shotguns, and clubs. Scabs loaded some boxes onto the truck while the police stood guard. Once a lightly loaded truck tried to depart, it was allegedly rammed and blocked by a picket truck with a couple dozen strikers in the back. The police immediately responded by firing their shotguns into the truck without warning. Though the scene lasted just minutes, it was a massacre. Pickets tried to help some of the strikers that fell from the truck, but were also shot by the police. According to some strikers, the police even shot them from the upper stories of a neighboring warehouse. They shot to kill despite there being no present danger to their safety. The strikers had not attacked the police and were unarmed. Most strikers were fleeing as evidenced by the fact injuries were mainly sustained on the backs of their arms, shoulders, and legs, while the police sustained only minimal casualties, including a friendly fire incident. The scab truck escaped just before ambulances and four National Guard trucks with mounted machine guns and armed men arrived at the scene. Ambulances picked up only a few wounded strikers while the rest were transported in private cars to the strike headquarters, where Dr. McCremen and the many nurses who volunteered following the news of the event treated wounds as best they could. Workers were informed of the incident with the strike organ, and hundreds flooded the streets around headquarters, volunteering to protect the hall by chasing off the police and lining up to donate blood to the injured. In total, at least 67 were injured, including Harry DeBoer, who was shot in the leg and damn near lost it. Strikers with serious injuries like his were transported to the hospital, a risky decision as several strikers caught charges there, though these charges were later dropped. Of the most seriously injured, one striker named Henry B. Ness stood out, having sustained a serious chest wound likely from a point-blank shotgun blast. He was transported to HQ, but his injuries were so serious he was taken to St. Barnabas Hospital, where doctors removed 38 slugs from his body and he received several blood transfusions to no avail. Ness succumbed to his injuries on July 22nd, though he wouldn't be the only fatality as John Belor would pass away August 1st. Ness was the father of four children and had been in the union 16 years. Local 574 organized a funeral, including visitation and a massive procession. This funeral was so emotional that Bill Brown broke down while giving his eulogy and couldn't finish it. Afterwards, thousands lined the streets and followed his hearse to his final resting place. By some estimates, over 50,000 people attended the funeral of Ness, who became a martyr of the union. Not all were sympathetic. The Minneapolis Journal had callously reported his death in a way that assigned fault to him and the strikers, though a later investigation would find that the police started the incident. This event polarized people along class lines within the city. On one side were people who supported law and order, opposing Local 574 to the point that they justified the bloodshed and hoped for a strike defeat that would permanently put down the union. But on the other side were Minneapolis's working class supporters of the union, who in response to the shooting came out by the thousands for a rally hosted by the Dunn brothers, Dobbs, Brown, and many other labor leaders. Now, Local 574 wasn't calling for a formal general strike at this point, but the option was on the table as they believed defeat would be catastrophic for the local and national labor movement. That day, a petition circulated the city calling for the removal of Mike Johannes and the impeachment of Mayor Bainbridge, getting over 20,000 signatures. Despite that, the bosses and the police chief remained adamant and continued to move trucks escorted by the police. Many strikers decided to arm themselves in order to stop the convoys, but union leaders disarmed anyone who brought firearms to the headquarters. They reminded the strikers that an armed conflict would lead to defeat, encouraging peaceful tactics but defense when necessary. Plus, further escalation was unnecessary. 
You see, the sheer number of strikers in the streets, while unable to completely halt trucking, made it extremely difficult and expensive. To escort a single truck, it took nearly 40 cops and cost employers a dollar a shipment and taxpayers $200 a shipment. In one case, they needed 16 SWAT cars just to transport three wheelbarrows and a toolbox. Ooh, not getting a high return on investment on that one. Governor Olson, fearful that Bloody Friday was just the beginning of more violent confrontations, threatened to declare martial law. The employers opposed martial law, but were also furious that the National Guard wasn't being used to restore law and order and open the streets, or in simpler terms, break the strike. Meanwhile, Haas and Dunnigan were scrambling to come up with a settlement to end the strike. What they eventually came up with was a settlement which reinstated all workers, provided elections to see if Local 574 represented most workers, more sufficiently defined inside workers, created a five-man arbitration board to resolve conflicts, and accepted the union's minimum wage of 52.5 cents for drivers with 42.5 cents for everyone else. It would more or less be a union victory. While neither side was truly satisfied with the terms of the agreement and issued their own proposals, the union voted 1,866 to 147 to accept the plan on Wednesday, July 25th. To further add pressure, Governor Olson declared that if the agreement was not accepted, martial law would go into effect and only trucks with the military permit would be allowed to move. Neither side wanted that, but the employers refused to sign claiming that they rejected the minimum wage, did not want to reinstate any worker found guilty of violence, disagree with the election conditions and the chair of the arbitration board, and above all would not sign an agreement with communists. The employers also escalated their Red Scare campaign, which included the arrest of Cannon and Max Schachtman and the search of their hotel rooms without warrant the night of the 25th. Now, I'm not going to go into the full details about what happened after. This video is long enough already. But long story short, both were briefly imprisoned by the police and the National Guard before they agreed to leave Minneapolis, only to return after petitioning Olsen that their right to freedom of the press not be infringed. Schachtman would leave before the strike's end, while Cannon remained for its entirety. Anyway, because employers refused to sign the agreement, Olsen declared martial law and ordered the National Guard into the streets on July 26th. A curfew was established, no vehicles were allowed to park downtown, large gatherings required a permit, and picketing was forbidden or one might find themselves in the temporary stockade on the state fairgrounds. Most importantly, truck movement supervision was taken over by the National Guard. They created a system that allowed employers to apply for a permit that would allow trucks through for necessities. The simple bare necessities. <clears throat> uh, excuse me. Uh, though necessities was not clearly defined. Vince Dunn justifiably denounced martial law and the permit system as state-sanctioned strike-breaking, since most of the 4,000 permits approved by Sunday, July 29th barely fit the definition of necessities. The simple bare necessities. Worse still, the press complained of shortages, so the list of acceptable deliveries was expanded to all wholesale meat, eggs, and all dairy products. While there was some resistance in the form of strikers confronting scabs and tipping over trucks, by August 1st, an estimated two-thirds to three-fourths of trucking traffic was back on the roads. This, however, made little sense, as the original terms of martial law favored the employers, even though it was them refusing to sign the agreement that led to it in the first place. So, the Communist League of America Strike Steering Committee, led by Ray Dunn, Dobbs, Goglin, Cannon, and Al Goldman, challenged Olson's martial law, demanding that Local 574 be allowed to host rallies, continue picket operations, that the National Guard would be drawn, and that there be a 48-hour trucking moratorium to transition. Skoglin further proposed that after the 48-hour period, permits should only be issued to employers who signed the Haas Dunningen Agreement. Olson agreed to limit permits, but refused to accept the union's demands. That evening, Tuesday, July 31st, a rally of 25,000 was held where local 574 declared the Farmer Labor Party to be strikebreakers and that Olson's actions undermined labor and would ultimately lead to their defeat. The union declared the pickets would resume. Because the union did not have a permit, even though later on it would be discovered that it actually did have one, and it called the strikers to action, Olson ordered the arrests of the organizers of the General Drivers Union. In the dead of night at 3.55 a.m., 800 armed soldiers of the National Guard surrounded the strike headquarters and arrested the strike leaders. Bill Brown, Miles Dunn, and Vince Dunn were all taken into custody, while Farrell Dobbs and Grant Dunn managed to give them the slip and immediately started organizing pickets from gas stations. Carl Skoglin was also safe, out of town in Chicago raising funds for the Union. The strikers quickly adapted. 
moving the commissary to CLU AFL headquarters, though it, along with other union spots, were raided by the National Guard hours later. Strikers soon started carrying out hit-and-run guerrilla tactics. Strikers went around town tipping over trucks, ripping out ignition wire, roughing up scab truck drivers, and distributing commandeered goods to working class neighborhoods, escaping for the military could arrive to stop them. Olson's actions, which he thought would help end the strike, had clearly backfired and agitated the strikers even more. Olson, a former Wobbly apparently, believed that with the leadership arrested, the General Drivers Union would appoint a committee more representative of his members. In other words, not communists which would get the employers to agree to the deal. But he failed to consider the political backlash. There were talks of a formal general strike as the arrest of union leaders pissed off even the most conservative labor leaders. The organizer called Olsen a scab and a friend of capital. And it was clear that his decisions were costing him votes, and by extension, votes for the farmer labor party. Olsen finally agreed to meet with Dobbs and Grant Dunn, where they demanded the release of the strike leaders and the removal of the National Guard from strike headquarters. Olson, eager to regain favor from Minneapolis's working class, agreed, further revised the permit system, and ordered a raid on the Citizens Alliance headquarters on August 2nd. Three days later, Olson revoked 9,000 trucking permits, reaching only about 1,000. Following that, the employers stepped up their game when it came to fighting both martial law and the strike. The employers attempted to use the courts to end martial law, basically arguing that it interfered with their freedom of business, but this went nowhere. They also brought in scabs from New York, paying some as much as $35 a week when the union was fighting for just $20 a week. Remember, it's not just about wages, it's about control. The militia continued its crackdown on pickets, sending hundreds of strikers to the stockade for up to 90 days for picket violations. This included something as innocuous as distributing the union's organs, the organizer, and the militant. However, the general drivers were undeterred. On Monday, August 6th, the union held its largest rally of the strike, attended by 40,000 people, where union leaders encouraged strikers to continue the pickets, protest against martial law, and fight for industrial unionism. The union refused to concede anything from the haas dunningen Agreement, which was slowly becoming the basis for the new permit system. At this point, about 50 firms unaffiliated with the Trucking Employers Committee chose to break from the pledge to hold out and sign the agreement so that the trucking operations could resume. By now, the Roosevelt administration was putting increased pressure on Haas and Dunnigan to end the strike. They all came to the conclusion that the employers would never agree to the Haas-Dunnigan agreement and decided to propose a new settlement that removed elements unpopular with the employers to the entire strike committee rather than just the negotiators. On August 13th, Dobbs and Vincent Dunn met with Haas. Naturally, they weren't down with the revised agreement, which contained no wage guarantee, no guarantee for reinstatement, and would establish an employer-created secret ballot election process that might allow scabs to vote, but decided to call a meeting with the 100 committee members anyway. When Haas and Dunnigan presented the terms to the committee, the committee got their asses. They outright refused what they called the boss's deal and insulted the mediators for even bringing it to them. The union refused to settle for anything less than what had been agreed to in the original settlement. Haas and Dunnigan attempted to save face, but there was little they could say. This was a pretty harsh defeat for these men who called themselves the Friends of Labor. Following this event, Bill Brown and Mick Dunn attempted to organize a 48-hour general strike within Minnesota to bring an end to the strike on the union's terms. However, things were starting to look grim within Local 574. The July strike had proved costly, much like the previous strike, and not just for the General Drivers Union. Goldman presented the idea that Local 574 had lost the strike and should settle, calling attention to the ever-increasing amount of trucking under the National Guard and saying that children were going hungry, electricity, gas, and water were being turned off by utility companies for unpaid bills, and landlords were evicting strikers. But the leaders stood strong and refused to give in. They knew the strikers still had some fight left in them, and that to give up would lead to complete defeat. On August 15th, P.A. Donahue arrived in Minneapolis to assist Haas and Dunnigan in ending the strike as soon as possible. Donahue wasn't just another mediator either, as he created the election process that ended the Longshoremen's strike. Don't worry, you can expect a video on that one too. Donahue figured that Local 574 had already signed the Haas Dunnigan Agreement, so he needed to get the Employers Committee to agree to it in a way where it wouldn't appear they had settled with communists. He reached out to the guiding spirit of the Citizens Alliance and Truck and Employer Committee member A.W. Strong, successfully convincing him that Local 574 would never accept a settlement that did not contain a pledge to rehire all workers and a definite minimum wage. 
Ultimately, the terms of the settlement were a minimum hourly wage of 52.5 cents for drivers and 42.5 cents for helpers and everyone else, arbitration boards that could only raise this wage, de facto union recognition, and the right for local 574 to represent all its members. Don Hu then put together the election to be organized by the Regional Labor Board. To satisfy local 574's concerns about scabs voting, it was decided that only those who had been on the trucking firm's payroll as of July 16th were allowed to vote. Inside workers were more or less defined, as it was decided that those who spent 60% of their work time selling goods could not vote. Donahue organized elections at all 166 employers, even though 574 had only wanted to conduct them at a minority of employers. The employers were convinced that this played into their hands, since they believed that a large number of their employees, who were basically unaffiliated with Local 574, would vote against it. Even if 574 won, an employer could argue that many of their workers didn't even want to be a part of the union, allowing them to save face. The union requested a written agreement related to the establishment of the arbitration boards in order not to fall into the same situation that followed the May strike. Using the organizer, the union leaders educated strikers on the terms of the election. They reiterated that they would not compromise on the parts of the agreement they had fought hard for, all while still encouraging a two-day general strike of all organized labor as a failsafe. No union man would participate in the election unless the union approved it. The election and settlement were ready on Monday, August 20th and presented to Dobbs and Dunn. The terms were favorable to the union. Once the Committee of 100 was informed, all agreed to recommend acceptance of the terms in the Labor Board elections. Meanwhile, 155 employers voted in favor of the agreement. On August 21st, it was ratified and the 1934 Minneapolis Teamsters strike officially came to an end. Headlines announced that the strike and martial law were over. The employers, who had spent months complaining about Local 574 in the press, had nothing to say about their loss. The union and much of Minneapolis's working class spent the next 12 hours celebrating. As Cannon put it, the strikers won because they fought all who stood in their way, from the employers to the police and the National Guard to the federal mediation team. Following the strike came the election. Here are the results. The employers claimed victory, saying that trucking firms won more votes, concluding that the union did not represent the majority of workers. 21 of the firms held no vote, which could be explained by smaller firms that failed during the strike and employers pressuring them to vote against their union. There was a tie at 15 firms, not too much of a problem as the union still had the right to represent its members there. While the employers won at 68 firms, the union won at 62, getting 724 of the 1,362 votes, or 53% in absolute votes. Local 574 fared even better at the larger firms, getting an approval rate of 69%. In the end, Local 574 won the right to represent workers at 77 individual firms, with new opportunities to represent workers at smaller companies where they had a minority of supporters. In a way, the decision to have all firms be represented in the Employers Committee backfired, since it meant that 155 separate employers were now tied to this settlement. In the aftermath, Minneapolis went from an open shop city to a union town. Local 574 wasn't out of the woods yet, though. The Teamsters and the FL's reaction to this event would have harsh consequences for the local, but that's a story for a different video. Right. So what should we take away from all this? Well, we leftists can organize massive strike actions when we organize within our workplaces. We saw how Trotskyists were able to organize a massive strike that froze or severely limited trucking in Minneapolis for weeks. They achieved this by creating the strike support networks they needed prior to the strike, understanding that these networks don't just happen spontaneously. The leaders organized the unemployed, farmers to provide food, the women's auxiliary to feed the people, the organizer to inform Minneapolis's working class, and created a base of operations. The leaders and the workers created the infrastructure and organization they needed to win. They adopted a strategy to conduct pickets all across Minneapolis and were able to quickly adapt to new obstacles from the police and National Guard. They never trusted the mediators and refused to give up, even when it seemed like all was lost. They understood the role of progressive politicians within an event like this, that even those who relied on working class support to remain in office would side with capital over the workers. Though the networks weren't able to free prisoners or completely support everyone, they were still able to give workers a place to sleep and eat. However, one could also make the argument that centralizing much of the leadership within a few individuals made them more susceptible to strike-breaking tactics from the National Guard, such as when many of the union leaders were arrested. A more decentrally organized group would probably be more effective in this regard, but we'll explore this topic in a future video.
What we should take away from this video is that in order for American workers to have a general strike, we must be able to organize similar networks on a much larger scale. And that's what's missing from Twitter conversations about a general strike. People are calling for a general strike and marking dates on their calendars, focusing much more on the glamorous action of mass walkouts without discussing the mutual aid networks needed to support communities. What we need are more resources to educate people on mutual aid networks and how they support a general strike. Prior to the July strike, Local 574 held meetings where they educated Minneapolis' working class on strike strategies. We need something similar to educate people on how to create these networks and why they are so crucial. Whenever we see another call for a general strike, we need a way to communicate to people what it takes to actually have one. Thankfully, there are people out there responding to general strike threats and educating people on these topics. The more that we educate people, the better understanding they will have of strike support. And with a developed understanding of strike support, we will be able to organize a general strike that will win, just like Local 574 did. Thanks for watching. This video was longer than expected, and I say that after like most of my videos, and I don't know why I expect to make short videos. Anyway, this is genuinely one of my favorite strikes, so I had to make a longer one. Plus, I know a fair share of Teamsters and trade unionists from Minneapolis who would bombard my comments section if I left out certain details, so uh, naturally I had to. Believe it or not, there's actually stuff I cut out for time. So if you truly want the full story, I highly recommend you read these books. The Minneapolis Teamsters Strike of 1934 by Philip Korth, Revolutionary Teamsters by Brian D. Palmer, and Teamster Rebellion by Farrell Dobbs. That being said, this one took a lot out of me. So I'm gonna focus on some smaller videos. I know I'm saying smaller, I promise they will be small before we wrap up the General Strike series. We got one more General Strike to cover and I'm pretty sure you can guess which one it is. Anyway, I'll see you on the next one.